All right, guys, welcome to another edition of Capturing Christianity. We are a ministry aimed at exposing the intellectual side of Christian belief. For the last year, we've been hosting discussions, uh, not really debates, more discussions because sort of informal discussions between Christians and non-Christians on a variety of topics. Uh, today's discussion is a new topic that we haven't covered before. It's on the fine-tuning argument for God's existence. We have uh, Luke Barnes and Alex Malpass. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, good, I'm getting the heads up there. Uh, so, like I said, they're discussing the fine-tuning argument for God's existence, which is one of the most interesting arguments. I think most people, uh, Christians and non-Christians, can agree that this is one of the more interesting arguments for God. Uh, even if you ultimately disagree with it, it's one of the more interesting ones because it is so um, based in science and, and cosmology, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, Luke is our Christian and Alex is our non-Christian guest today. And if you've seen the show before, we don't really do long introductions. We get right into the argument. So if you want to learn more about the guests, just go uh, visit the website, capturingchristianity.com. Just search for the discussion there. You will, uh, you'll find all that you need to, to know about these guys, their links to their social media pages and all that stuff, uh, the books that they've written. Um, and at the website, you'll find all of our social media links, Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, uh, you can find the podcast there as well. And if you've liked the content that we've been producing, if you've been enjoying the discussions, the articles, the podcast, and you want to support us, head over to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. And then uh, lastly, just to remind you, we've recently opened a shop where you can buy apologetics gear, t-shirts, and uh, we even have a fine tuning uh, t-shirt there if you want to check that out as well. Uh, so capturingchristianity.com for all that and more. Uh, all right. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the discussion. So first of all, thank you guys for, for coming on. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you guys here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks very much. Cool. All right. So the structure of, the, of uh, today's discussion, the structure of it's going to look like this. Uh, Luke is going to spend about five, 10 minutes laying out the basic structure of the argument. He has some slides uh, slides prepared. He's going to show on the screen. Uh and then after this, we're going to turn directly to Alex, who uh, is going to give his top objections to the argument. And then from there, it's just going to be a really uh, free-flowing discussion. So without further ado, go ahead and take it away, Luke. And uh, feel free to start sharing your screen there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready to go. Good. Um, okay, sorry, you can see the, the, the slides. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I can see them. Uh, okay. they're, they're they're up on the uh, the main screen here. So yeah, good, excellent. Great. Yep. All right. So I've I have too many slides here. So let's just try and get through them. Let me introduce uh, fine tuning first, and then uh, say a little bit about Bayes' theorem and probabilities and how that leads us to the fine tuning argument. So the idea of fine tuning is basically there are these numbers that describe our universe. Things like uh, you know. Uh, protons and neutrons and electrons, they're all made of quarks. And one of the ba basic numbers of the universe is, is how much do these basic bits of the universe weigh? How much does an up quark weigh? How much does a down quark weigh? How much does an electron weigh? Um, now, the, the equations we have which describe how these things work don't tell us what that number is, so we can go out and measure it to a degree of precision, but we don't know why they are what they are which tells us that we can then go look through a set of possibilities. So we might represent that set of possibilities in a sort of three-dimensional space here, which uh, goes up to something called the Planck mass and is uh, 60 orders of magnitude on the side for various technical reasons. And what we can do is say, okay, what, you know, you are here, as you can see, what would happen if we went somewhere else in this block of possibilities, right? If we change the mass of the electron by going up or down and all those sorts of things. And what we find is that actually a whole heap of interesting disasters kind of wait. So um, we, we can carve off bits of the block where bad things happen. Um, so you want to stay clear of that bit of the block I just carved off because otherwise, um, well, Otherwise, the, the thing you make out of quarks in those two bits are up, 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 or down, down, down. They're called the delta plus plus, delta minus particles. And the short story is they don't stick to each other. So you've got a basic Lego set of the universe, and none of the pieces stick to each other. And so you could make a lump of things, but that's about it. You don't do anything as interesting as chemistry. Um, so that's a start, but there's a whole heap of other things that... Um, 
you need to happen for protons and neutrons to stick together for them to be suitable um, uh, fuel for stars. And if you start cutting bits off, you end up um, with a very a narrow sliver through parameter space. And actually, it's slightly worse than this one once we start thinking about um, stability of, of atoms in stars, nuclei in stars. And so the final picture you get is uh, if you want the stuff in the universe to stick to itself to make anything interesting, and if you want that interesting stuff to power stars, you'd better be in that very thin sliver there in parameter space. And remember, this is in logarithmic space, right? So every step up on the on an axis is, is not going one, two, three, four linear style. It's going logarithmically. So it would be 1, 10, 100, 1,000. That, that helps us actually see this bit of parameter space. <coughs> Sorry, if we didn't have that, then uh, we'd need this box to be a couple of light years high just to see the relevant bit. So that, in, in very short supply, that's fine tuning. Let me just stick a razor blade there just to give you a visual representation. Uh, it, it's important to remember this is something that comes out of the scientific literature and it goes all the way to the sort of deepest parameters that we know. So the the uh, there's a, a number that represents the sort of basic mass of the Higgs field, which gives you the basic mass of the universe. So in this, pa this paper in 2008, Physical Review D, they had a look at that uh, particular parameter. And if you put it in units that uh, of, of sort of natural units, Planck units, it's that uh, narrow range at the bottom there, which is a very small sliver. So the number is already sort of unnaturally small, sort of two times 10 to the minus 17. And then you've got to be in that sort of narrowish range around it. So that's, that's what's going on here with fine tuning. If you're outside of that range one way, then uh, um, no nuclei stick to each other. And if you're out of that range the other way, then hydrogen itself is unstable. Um, there's other cases. Let me just very quickly go through these. Uh, in To make carbon in the universe, there's a very special process that needs to happen in stars, which roughly looks like that. What you've got there, two helium come together to make beryllium, that thing in the middle with eight um, nucleons. And then another helium needs to come along in a very special circumstance to make carbon. And when we try to work out, okay, how, uh, what needs to happen with these fundamental numbers for that to happen. Then there's a whole series of papers which try to do this. We need to modern theory of nuclear forces, and then they do these calculations and those calculations and these calculations and those calculations, and they stick it into a supercomputer that's doing six petaflops, if you know your computing jargon. That's about 60,000 times faster than your average um, computer. And at the end of all that, they find out that uh, it's on the right-hand side, I don't know if you can actually see my mouse, but on the right-hand side there, the light quark masses are tuned to 2 to 3%. If you want this particular process to make carbon in our unit, carbon the way it does in our universe, then you, you better hit those light quark masses uh, pretty accurately. Now, that's 2% relative to the value in our universe, which is a very small amount relative to the, the overall set of possibilities. So I've talked about the masses. Um, there's also the... Uh, forces, just these are some very busy plots, so just get the overall idea here. We can take the strength of electromagnetism on the x-axis, the strength of the nuclear strong force on the y-axis, and look at bits of the universe, which are kind of a bad idea. Um, so on the bottom right there, you've got the carbon is unstable. If you make the strong force too weak, you can make the proton itself unstable in that red band there. Um, there's a few other disasters hanging around. Um, actually, this, this this green bit on the left, the top left, stable diproton needs to back off a bit. Wrote a paper on that recently. Um, but just to give you a, a sort of an idea, we can go into scientific details here, but I'm, I'm, we're probably just uh, more, more interested in the uh, philosophy of things. So let me try and skip ahead. We can do the same thing um, with cosmological parameters. Um, so these aren't parameters of how the beat, the smaller stuff in our universe works. They're about how the overall universe works, um, the big scale stuff. So the cosmological constant is there on the x-axis and on the y-axis that's related to um, well, it's, it's a, uh, the, the sort of lumpiness of the universe. So this is the cosmological constant problem. There's 10 to the, 10 to the power of minus 20, what, minus 120 there on the x-axis. You can see 120, 130 there. So unless you're very close to zero, 
uh, you either get no halos or very dense or too diffuse halos and things don't happen. So you don't get structure that forms in the universe. Um, I've actually been doing some simulations of this work recently. So um, that's all cool and fun. So that's basically uh, fine tuning. So that paper that that uh, image comes from considered eight constraints on seven fundamental parameters. There's too much math going on in that slide. Just to say that there's this myth going around that fine tuning only happens when you vary one um, one parameter at a time, which is not true. Um, so two other quick cases just before we end. Uh, this is a, an image from Roger Penrose's book, The Road to Reality. It's about entropy in the universe. And our universe started off with a very low entropy. And so uh, Penrose has this quite fanciful description, as he says there in the, in the uh, caption, that if you want to just sort of hit the, the right bit of, of uh, it's, in this case, it's called phase space, but how you arrange the stuff in our universe, if you want to hit it at random, you've got to hit an extraordinarily small volume, one pi in 10 to the 10 to 123. Entropy is kind of its own talk, so I'll just I'll raise that and we can talk about that uh, if we like. Now, finally, um, the number of space dimensions and the number of time dimensions. Now, this is the number of large space and large time dimensions, if you know string theory, which um, no one truly does. So, um, so on, on the x-axis there, how many spatial dimensions? So you are here where three, and we have one time dimension. These turn up in our equations in, in quite predictable and straightforward ways. And so when, as uh, Max Tegmark did in the paper that's referenced at the top there, what happens if you start changing things? Actually, there's a whole heap of interesting calamities elsewhere if you change the number of time and space dimensions. In particular, where it says unpredictable in the large purple and the large green bits, something kind of interesting happens. Um, if you want to predict what's going to happen in the future, and that includes just your environment around you being predictable, then... Uh, you, in those universes, you would need an infinite amount of information, which isn't possible. And so the universe, while it obeys laws, becomes practically unpredictable. So there's a, a whirlwind, way too quick introduction of fine tuning. The other half of the, the other bit of the argument I'm, we're going to need to talk about is probabilities. So let me give you a very quick introduction to how a physicist thinks about probabilities. So there's a, a bit of a culture clash here with the way philosophers sometimes do it, but we can get to that. Um, so let me quickly say, uh, look at this slide. So the probabilities are used in different ways and it's all it, important to get the right way when we talk about this. So suppose that there are sort of, as I count them in the way physicists use them, not necessarily exhaustively, there are sort of five different w ways that uh, probability might be thought about. And we can illustrate this with a, you know, I flip a coin and the probability of heads is a half. What do I mean by that? Well, I might be a finite frequentist, and what I mean by that is that of all the coin flips that have ever happened, half of them have come up heads. So it's a claim about you know actual coin flips. I might be a hypothetical fre frequentist, where if I kept flipping this coin an infinite number of times, the fraction that were heads would approach a half. Um, I might be uh, talking about objective chances, which is more of a physics term, which is just saying that the, the the coin and the thumb and the table together um, have a roughly, uh, will roughly produce uh, heads half of the time. I might be a subjective Bayesian where I'm talking about the subjective state of uncertainty of an individual. I'm reporting my own brain, which is sort of 50 50 between whether this coin is going to come up heads or tails. Well, finally, there's something called objective Bayesianism, um, which is kind of the degree of plausibility of a proposition given a state of knowledge. So you, it's not just reporting some individual's brain state. It's um, it, it's uh, actually saying, what's the relationship between two uh, different uh, states of knowledge, two different propositions? Now, uh, in recent years, the physical science has been overwhelmingly turning towards what I've called their objective Bayesianism. These terms are very slippery, just to warn you. One of the reasons why we're turning to that is uh, it gives a lot more scope for theory testing. There's a lot of reasons. Um, but just ask the question, given what we've observed about the solar system, can we say that general relativity, Einstein's idea of relativity, is more probable than Newton's idea of gravity? Okay, so there's a question that it seems like a scientist would want to ask, right? 
given what we know, is it more likely that Einstein was right than that Newton was right? The problem with is with these other interpretations is we can't say that statement. We can't even ask that question. It, it's it's at that level. So finite frequentism can't ask it because it's not like we've observed a thousand universes and Einstein was right in 999 of them. It's not hypothetical frequentism either. It's not that if we had observed a thousand universes, dot, dot, dot. It's not objective chance. We're not saying that the universe, you know, decides every second Tuesday to obey Newton. Um, we're not really making the subjective Bayesian claim either. I mean, we're trying to do physics here. We're not really interested in just reporting our own psychology. And so it's really only the objective Bayesian who can make this sort of claim. Um, with this claim, um, there are sort of theorems you can look at that, that tell you that um, plausibility is what our idea of plausibility, if we give it the right sort of structure, will obey the rules of probability. And you get all the normal probability laws out of that. I'm happy to talk about that for a while. But very simply, the idea of this probability Probability, you read it there on the right, the thing that Bender, Bending Rodriguez is saying there, probability of B given A. The idea is you just feed two propositions into the robot and it will tell you the plausibility of one given the other. I realise I'm going sort of longer than my time here. Sorry, I'll try and wrap things up. Um, so here's the idea. Okay, we have this thing which says the probability of one statement given another statement and what we want to try and do then is to say, it's that one in the middle up the top there. Okay, I've got some theory, some idea that I'm interested in that I want to know, is it likely or unlikely? And what I'm going to feed in as given is just everything that I know. Given everything that I know, is it likely that dot, dot, dot? Okay, so that's the basic question. Now, if you're lucky enough for that number to come sort of uh, floating down from the clouds, then you're done. Uh, so enjoy that. If, however, you need some help calculating that particular number, Bayes' theorem is here to help you. And the idea is if, if everything that you know can be expressed as a conjunction, if, if, if you know more than one thing, if you know A and B and C and D and E and all of that, then you can split up everything you know K into two pieces, sort of X and Y. And then Bayes' theorem lets you write the thing you want to know on the left there, the probability of the idea given everything, in terms of all these probabilities over on the right, which you might actually be able to guess or calculate or whatever. Now, it's important. All of that happens. There's there's a sort of narrative that goes along with Bayes sometimes, that's just, which is uh, about priors and background information and likelihoods and updating. None of that is essential to the process. All that's going on here is if you think you can calculate those numbers, then you can get the number you want. If you think you can get these ones on the right here, which have various technical names, then you can get the one on the left, and that's all there is to it. The most important one for what's going to happen next is uh, the one on the top of the fraction on the left there, the probability of X given T and Y, which just says, assume your theory is true and slice off X like a bit of the stuff that you know that you think you can calculate the probability of and then see whether um, on the theory, assuming that this theory, whatever it is, is true, would you expect to see X, whatever X is, given t given the theory and whatever you've left in Y? So with that, let me very quickly get on to the fine-tuning argument. And usually what I say to audiences at this point is I say protons have mass. I didn't even know they were Catholic by Woody Allen. Because I don't usually talk about the fine-tuning argument. I just talk about the science of fine-tuning. But let me try and sort of outline this. So here's uh, quickly a definition of naturalism, just from some naturalists. So I'm not trying to create a straw man here, although there are some differing views about what this means. So naturalism says there's only one realm of existence, the natural world whose behavior can be studied through reason and empirical investigation. So I take naturalism to be claimed that concrete stuff, only physical stuff is concrete existing stuff. So only physical stuff exists. On the other hand, we have theism, and uh, there exists now and has always existed and will exist God, a spirit, a non-embodied person who is omnipresent. God is the creator of all things in that it is uh, in that for all logically contingent things to exist apart from himself, he brings it about or makes it or permits that other beings to bring about their existence. Classic. Uh, yeah, with all the <laughs> philosopher's definition with all the little bits and pieces. So I, I assume people roughly know what we mean by God. 
Uh, but we'll give a, a <coughs> just to be clear, there's Richard Swinburne's definition from the existence of God. So here's how I think this argument roughly works. Um, uh, we can think of this as a kind of roulette table, just to use a gambling um, thing. And we ask, what would we expect to be true if theism were true? And what would we expect to be true if naturalism were true? And so what we need to work out to, to sort of get a handle on that set of probabilities is what, what could possibly have been true on those two ideas, and then we can try to sort that out. So if we consider sort of a set of possibilities very abstractly, um, <clears throat> possibilities of how the universe could have been here, this could be, you know, two of the properties of the universe. There's a small life-permitting range there in green, and the question is, okay, where where does the where do these ideas place their probabilities? Um, so if you know, sorry, just going back, um, if you know roulette, which there's no reason you should, uh, before the ball goes spinning around on the uh, the wheel there on the left, you place your bets over on the right here as to where you think it's going to end up, and if you're wrong, you lose your money, which is what's probably going to happen. So don't gamble. Uh, but if you're correct, then um, you win back some some number of times whatever you bet. So the more you bet on the specific winner, uh, the more you win, obviously. But if you see the 10 there right in the middle, that, that 10 token sort of split over a couple of different uh, options there. And so that's hedging your bets. You will win less with that, but you are more likely to win. So if a black two comes up, you'll win sort of, you've, you bet a quarter on that, so you have a bit. Um, just the idea of hedging your bet. So here's the idea. On naturalism, because there's there's no principle deeper than the ultimate laws of nature, if we ask what would we expect to be the case on naturalism as, uh, in terms of this parameter space, naturalism kind of hedges its bets. Uh, there's no reason on naturalism to expect a priori any particular universe, and so its likelihood is kind of spread out over all the possibilities because there are no other principles if, once you're at the ultimate laws of nature. And so in particular, when this particular green square comes up, naturalism doesn't win very much because it had to spread all its you know one unit of probability over all of this, whereas the picture for theism is, okay, we can understand the actions of God if we have, if we can see a reason for God to do something. Uh, our universe has moral value; would be the reason for God to create this universe. And so, while there's still some hedging of bets on, theism has kind of a hot tip that actually our universe, which does something morally significant, is more likely to come up. And so, it places its bets more heavily on what turns out to be the actual universe. So, here's the summary slide in the last ten seconds. What kind of universe would we expect on naturalism? A dead one. And uh, there are morally good reasons for, there are good reasons for God to make a morally significant universe. The, the God hypothesis explains something deep about why our universe is put together the way that it is. And sorry for going too long there, but that's that's the end of my slides. No problem. I think, I mean, fine-tuning argument, well, at least the way that you've presented is, is uh, unique to me. I haven't really seen that anywhere yet, but... Um, <laughs> Why don't we go to uh, Alex now? And we took, what was that, about 20 minutes? Yeah. Uh, so, Alex, obviously, you're going to have the same time if you want to take all that time up. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really whatever you want to do. So if you want to take that much time or if you want to stop and uh, present something and then stop and then have a discussion, it's whatever you want to do. So uh, just take okay. it away. Um, all right, good. So thanks for the, thanks for the intro because um, it was very helpful. And... Though I do have some slides, they are hastily compiled and <laughs> they, they're nowhere near as slick as that. And I'm sure nothing I'll say this evening will be as, as slick as that either. Um, okay, so as some preliminaries, I mean, I guess I agree to some extent that um, with what Cameron was saying at the beginning, which is that this is kind of in some sense a formidable argument to come across. Certainly if you if you don't already agree with the conclusion, it can seem kind of intimidating because um, unless you're a cosmologist um, and happy playing around with those types of concepts, it's quite difficult to know. It's quite, it's quite imposing, right? Um, there's lots of big numbers, stupidly big numbers, 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. And what even is that? I have no idea. Can't imagine how big that is. Um, and I think for, partly for this reason, people, um, 
think it's a really good argument. You know, that alone is intimidating enough. Um, but I think that when you, it's like a, the fine tuning argument is like a hedgehog, where it's got this spiky exterior, but when if you turn it upside down, it's got an exposed underbelly. And the reason for that is that um, the argument is a, it's where a scientific, um, perfectly reasonable scientific research project meets theology. And that's where the, the soft underbelly kicks in. I'm, I'm not going to dispute any issue of physics that, that Luke wants to um, wants to claim, because he's an expert on physics, and I, I'm, I know nothing about physics. Well, I know nothing about physics, but I'm not going to try and disagree with him um, on any of those issues. Seems to me that the, so I mean, to some extent, I think I'm just going to grant everything about fine tuning. Some people disagree with it. I know, uh, for instance, I've seen Sean Carroll saying that he's not convinced that there is any fine tuning issue. Um, I just, let's just grant it for the sake of argument that, that all, of, all of those constants couldn't be varied any more than the way that Luke said without the things he said happening. I think I'm going to grant that, and even still, I think there's no reason, <laughs> no reason to think that, that uh, I think that gives you no reason to think that, that God exists. Um, I'll try and explain why I think that. But let's also note that to begin with, there are Christians or theists on both sides of this argument, right? There are theists like, like Luke and like Robin Collins who, who believe that God exists and that God created the universe um, and believe that this uh, fine tuning is evidence for that conclusion. But there are theists who believe that God exists and that God created the universe who don't think that fine tuning is evidence for that. Um, so Hans Halverson, um, he's a professor in philosophy of physics at Princeton. Uh, this other guy, Hud Hudson, they're both Christian philosophers. They both think that fine, they both think the conclusion is true, but they don't think that the, the argument is, gets you evidence to think that the conclusion is true. They think it's true for other reasons. Um, and there are atheists who don't believe that God exists, right? They don't believe that God created the universe, but they do believe that fine tuning is, is evidence that God exists and that God created the universe. And it kind of sounds a bit funny to begin with, but it's, it's like, I mean, if you, so let's see, the, it might be that we've got um, some video footage of Luke entering the library just before Colonel Mustard was found battered to death in the library, right? So that the evidence of Luke going in five minutes beforehand does raise my, my uh, probability that, that Luke's guilty, right? The hypothesis that Luke is guilty um, is increased in probability with that evidence. On the other hand, um, if I also see evidence of him leaving on the other side of the library and then going to collect his Nobel Peace Prize or whatever in front of millions of people, his Nobel Physics Prize, I suppose, uh, at exactly the time that Colonel Mustard was being murdered, Right, I, I have overwhelming evidence that he wasn't the murderer. Right, but that doesn't mean that, considered on its own, like right, the evidence of him walking into the library just beforehand, does you know, taken on its own, raise the probability that he was the murderer. And so that's what some atheists might say. You know, I've got other reasons for thinking that um, fine tuning. I, I I think that fine tuning raises the probability that, that God exists, but for other reasons, I I think that he doesn't exist. Right. So you can be a, an atheist and a theist on either side of this debate, and so wanted to kind of trace out that it's not just a completely partisan debate where it's two people who've already made their minds up just searching for things to back up their own um, their own already preconceived views like I said though I think I've, I think I fall into the camp of thinking that fine-tuning doesn't actually it's not persuasive to me um, and maybe I can go through some of the so I've prepared some some slides and I normally over slide when I'm preparing slides I did that here and then I had to cut back. So let me, how do I view full screen? Is that gonna do it? What I wanna do is present, don't I? This. Okay, cool. So, uh, so real quick, it's got a, looks like you're not sharing your screen anymore. You might have to hit the, the thing on Google again. Hmm. Okay, cool. Let's see. Let's do this again. Uh, what also might be happening is that you're sharing the wrong screen. Do you have two screens? No. Mm. Hmm. It was fine until you hit the, the full screen. Yeah, that's what it's done. Okay.
How's that? There we go. Yeah, I can see it again. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about, I think, five problems, but let's just go through maybe one at a time, or maybe I'll do the first couple. So I'm calling this one the Goldilocks hypothesis problem, right? And this is just an outline of it. Um, but the idea is just, it's like the, actually, no, before we get into this, <laughs> sorry, let me actually just state the argument in premise conclusion form, because I think this is helpful. So this, um, this actually is the argument as Robin Collins presents it. Right? So premise one says, the probability, and L just means that the universe is life permitting or something, right? The probability that the universe is life permitting on naturalism is like some very, very far away from one. That's what that means. It's low, right? And the idea is that the probability, probability that the universe is life permitting on theism is not very, very far away from one, right? It's, it's better. And then premise three is just a statement of this thing called the the likelihood principle, which is just simply saying something like, um, it's kind of a definition, really. It just says that, look, if some evidence is more probable on hypothesis one and hypothesis two, then what this means is that the evidence supports hypothesis one over hypothesis two. And because in premise one and two show us that, um, that the, the fact that the universe is life permitting is more likely on theism than on naturalism, and we say that the, the evidence of the universe being life permitting um, supports theism over naturalism. It's evidence for theism. Okay, so that is the fine tuning argument. That's, at least this is the one that we've got on our sites here. So William Lane Craig has a slightly different version of this. Um, I think it's less interesting. It's, it's an attempt of a deductive argument. This one, we're playing the probability game that, that Luke was talking about before. Um, so. To me, this is this is the one I've got in my site. So this is the one that I'm going to be raising objections to in particular. Um, okay, so my to my here we go with my first objection. Right? This is focusing in on the T hypothesis, right? What is the T hypothesis? And it seems to me that there's a problem with the T hypothesis theism. Um, and if we pack too much content into the theism hypothesis, then it does um, it does mean the premise two looks correct, right, that it's not uh, very unlikely that we'd have a life permitting universe conditional on theism, right, it makes that premise two seem true. If we pack in enough content that premise two seems true, but it does so at the risk of making the premise look ad hoc, right, it's sort of, it's it's, a che it's cheating. You can make the, the um, probability go up, but only by kind of compromising kind of explanatory virtue, right, we don't want to do that. It's, it, it kind of isn't really an explanation if we do that. And then on the other hand, um, it, it seems to me if we try and solve that problem, or at least the obvious way that you'd think about solving that problem, um, we take out the offending uh, element in the equation, then what we find is that the T hypothesis stops raising the probability uh, beyond the naturalism hypothesis. They're becoming equivalent to each other. We find that the chances that the universe would be life supporting on the theist hypothesis is exactly the same as it is on the naturalist hypothesis, right? So premise two is false, and then so is the conclusion. And then the trick is that kind of the problem for the theist is to find some way of navigating these, right? Which is why I'm calling it the Goldilocks problem. You have to find some way in between these two extremes. And my claim is that it's a, at least super messy to try and find your way through then. It stops being really intuitive and easy, and there's got a whole host of problems. Um, so maybe I should pause and explain more because this is just an outline of what this problem is. Yeah, would you mind pulling up the slide that you have for the Goldilocks problem? Yeah, well, I have I have a couple of slides, so let me. Okay. Okay. How's this? So, what we might think, okay, to begin with, is that on this first bullet point, right, plausibly. The T hypothesis is a conjunction of two claims, right? It's the claim that there's an omnipotent being, right? So, so there's something that has, you know, can all power. So the way that Swinburne put it was that he's responsible for every contingent thing coming into existence, right? You have to have basically all power to be able to do that. Um, and and on, as well as that, the, the particular omnipotent being that we're talking about desires for L to come about, right? Desires for it to be the case that there's a life permitting universe, right? But then, now, if we move on to the second bullet point, what happens, it seems to me, on the conjunction of those two 
um, propositions is, yep, yeah, sure, the probability that the universe would be life permitting conditional on the this the uh, theism hypothesis is actually one, right? It kind of logically entails that there would be a life permitting universe. And the reason is that like an omnipotent being can't fail, right? It, there's no there's no way that it can fail. That's just what it means, right? There's nothing could get in its way. And it's like, oh, it's tripped up on its way to making the universe and forgot or something like an omnipotent being is kind of successful by definition in what it tries to do. Um, but it makes you think maybe this is, you should be suspicious here. I mean, like the probability wasn't just higher than on naturalism. It's like jumped all the way to one, right? Maximally certain. And there's something kind of weird about that. It seems to me you could do that with anything, right? I mean, let's say I flip a coin, the coin lands heads. I mean, let's compare the conditional hypotheses like we were doing before. I mean, yeah, I guess on the, on the hypothesis that the coin is just fair or something, I mean, what's the probability that it would land heads? I mean, 50-50, right? So I, I would say, you know, I'm kind of moderately surprised, not particularly surprised, right, when it comes up. I'm going to give that probability of like 0 0.5. Um, but now if we, if we put the same evidence, conditionalize it on the hypothesis that there's a being who's omnipotent um, and desires above all else that this coin would land heads, um, again, because an omnipotent being can't fail at making things come about that it wants to come about, the probability that it would land heads is one, right? So if we were to just run the argument that we looked at a minute ago, you'd, you'd think, well, every time I flip a coin, I should always conclude that there's an omnipotent being who desired for the coin to show exactly that, right? The likelihood principle makes me prefer that, that hypothesis to the one that says it just happened by chance, right? Um, it just feels like, you know, on the one hand, I, I feel like, am I rationally obliged every time something chancy happens to conclude that there's an omnipotent agent that made that happen? That seems wrong, right? Um, but also, there's something kind of weird and ad hoc about this. I mean, yeah, if I watch the coin and it lands heads, and then I kind of come up with a hypothesis, which is there's a being who wants exactly that to happen, that makes the probability go to one, right? But it's ad hoc in the sense that like, I can't make any predictions with that. I have to see the coin land first before I can make the, before I can do the calculation and figure out that it has probability one. I mean, if I said in advance, I, I'd have to remain agnostic as to whether there's gonna be a, an omnipotent being that wants to see heads or an omnipotent being that wants to see tails. And it doesn't help me make any predictions. I'm in just the same position as I would be on the chance hypothesis. So while this process can kind of generate an argument that looks like the fine tuning argument, it's, we're obviously doing things backwards. I'm, I'm firing an, an arrow at a tree, and then I'm painting the target around wherever it was that the, the arrow happened to land, right? And then claiming that I've got a bullseye. Right? So that, that's, it's ad hoc, and the argument's trivial, right? It's, just, it's not interesting. It doesn't matter what goes in this first slot, right? With the right T hypothesis, I can make the number here show one whatever's going on, right? So it's just kind of not interesting. That can't be what, like, something has to change here, it seems to me. So you might think, well, look, the, the T hypothesis had two, uh, two parts to it. All we had was two parts. It's om omnipotent being, kind of needs to be that. Um, and then it was the bit about the desires, right? We painted that on afterwards around the target. Well, let's, uh, let's just get rid of it. Let's see what happens if we just get rid of it. Well, it seems to me now on the, theistic hypothesis is just there's an omnipotent being, right? But he, we're not saying anything about what he desires. Um, I don't see why that hypothesis raises the probability that the universe would be life permitting. I mean, for all I know that an omnipotent being could want anything, right? He could just want there to be black holes. He could just want there to be no universes at all. Right? He could just want to be the only thing that exists. He might just want to end his own existence. I don't know, who knows, right? If we take the desires out, it doesn't help in any sense to just posit that there's an omnipotent being. That's the point. So if that's the hypothesis, it's actually equal to pure chance. It's the same as pure chance, right? So, so this is the Goldilocks hypothesis problem is if you pack in too much into the um, theistic hypothesis, then yeah, so it kind of does the work it needs to do, but in a way that feels ad hoc and unnatural and uninteresting. And then if you take away what seemed to be making it ad hoc and uninteresting, then we, we slam right from one, but right back down to exactly the same probability as we got under naturalism. So I think this is um, not a decisive objection. I think it's an interesting starting point. I think Luke's going to have something interesting to say in response to this. And it may well be that there's um, some technical issues that 
can be brought out that just kind of get around this. But I'm, I want to start here because kind of I want to see what Luke's response is going to be before we crack on. So I'm going to pause here just to see what the response is, if that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, actually, I agree with a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, early morning. Um, so, so I, actually, I agree. It, 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 saying this, this is being it desires L, and then that would mean that L is probability one. So, actually, the theist wouldn't want to give this universe a probability one. Well, the Christian especially. So that would make this universe kind of necessary somehow. And it's it's a sort of statement of Christian theology that you know God was free in creating the universe. Um, and then if you take L out, it, this this if you just have omnipotence, as you said, yeah, then God can do anything, which is unnaturalism, anything can happen, so that doesn't work. The key is to put something back in, but not something as strong as this being desires L. Um, so uh, so Swinburne's quite good on this. I should say there's a, there is a literature on this growing. Neil Manson, uh, who you may know as a philosopher, has got a quite good argue, uh, paper on this coming out. I think it's called How Not to, How Not to Be Too Generous to Fine-Tuning uh, Skeptics. Um, I don't know if it's out yet. I might try and find it. But so here's, here's what I'd say. The thing you've got to put in is that God is good, morally good. Um, <clears throat> and so if God were to create this universe, we could understand the reason why God would want to create this universe. And that's all you'd want to sort of say to that. I've got a very quickly, uh, let me just throw up a slide. I've got a summary of Swinburne on this. Might be helpful. Um, am I screen sharing? Yeah, so I won't actually just make it full screen. So Swinburne's argument is that a perfectly free good being will do any action that is the best action if there is one or else some good action and no bad action. Just goodness we can understand in those terms. And then humanly free agents, that is morally aware persons with limited free will, power and knowledge are good. Um, and if you want to put them in a morally significant environment, you, there has to be some sort of freedom, there has to be some sort of space the sort of a region of basic control, my body, and then a wider region where I interact with other people, which we call the universe. And so I think we're, we're <clears throat> the way to, you, you're right, we have to run a middle line here. Let me stop screen sharing. The way to do that as I see it, and again, you know, I'm a uh, astronomer, not a <laughs> theologian, but the, the way to do that I think is just God's goodness because that's the kind of property that was, um, is, is taken to be essential to the idea of at least uh, the god of theism. If you wanted to, you know, if it really came down, pushed to shelf, we could try to run other arguments that show that, that a, a morally good god exists. You could try to run the moral argument, but I'm not going to try and do that here, but that, that's always an option. We could try to lift the the prior on, on that sort of god, if you like. But even if you th even if we don't do that, I think it's God's goodness that makes the difference here. Difference here. We, if we pack that into T, we're not jerry rigging it because that's something that was packed into T, um, you know, in the Psalms. Uh, if you're a Christian, uh, and it 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 will do enough of the heavy lifting to make a life meeting universe more probable. So let me throw back to that. Would be my answer. Okay, good. So obviously, I, I thought you might go there. So. Let me see. I think I have three things that I, I want to say in response to that. So, look, firstly, um, what's the reason? So I might say something like this. You know, is there any independent reason? Okay, I, let's say I grant you that if God's good, um, and and then I also say something, I mean, I have to grant you that it's good that there's a life-permitting universe, right? I mean, if I grant you both of those things, and I, it starts to make it more plausible again, right? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's worth bringing up, but though I won't, I won't run it. But like you know, there's there are arguments that life isn't good. I mean that you know it's mostly suffering and um, it's mostly boredom and mostly kidding yourself when you're having fun. That it's actually more fun than it really is. And, and so there are these considerations in play that like really we we're, we're all just kind of biologically you know you have to think that life's good so that you laugh, last long enough to bring up kids and then you know if you did, if you had a proper appreciation of what it was like you would just check out as soon as possible or something right so maybe we could we, we could doubt the premise that it's good to have life anyway i mean so it doesn't seem to me that it's 
click, this open and shut case, even for that. But let's let's put that to one side, right? The other part of that was that you have to say that God is good, right? So he has, basically, he desires good things. That's basically what that means, it seems to me. Well, it means more than that, but it, it, the rubber hits the road at that point. Um, now, what's the reason for thinking that that's the case? Um, because it doesn't seem to me a priori that God's good. I mean, I can conceive of an evil God, for one thing. So it's there has to be something going on with that. Um, and yes, I guess you can you can have something like a, an ontological argument or a moral argument or something. I think we've got to be careful with with trying to go down this type of route for the following reason. Right? I mean, let's say I buy the ontological argument and that God's a maximal being, a perfect being, and that He exists because of that, and then you know, everything else floods out. He's om omnipotent, perfectly good, blah, 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 right? If I buy all of this great making properties stuff, well, now I don't really need the fine-tuning argument anymore, right? I mean, what's the point of the fine-tuning argument if you have to buy the ontological argument first? Because the ontological argument is a deductive proof, right? I mean, so I, you know, this famous quote by Kant, right, where he's saying, you know, um, beware of the dogmatist who comes with five proofs, right? If he really had even one, he wouldn't need any of the others. I suppose the idea is that like the deductive proof, if it does its job, is enough to convince you. You don't need any, any of the others. And fine tuning is already trying to do something much less ambitious than that. So I kind of wonder what the point of the fine tuning argument is if it only works by buying some other much stronger argument. Um, and then it seems to me, I mean, you know, we, we, we're not going to go down that route, but I obviously don't buy that any of those ontological argument, moral argument, they don't seem like good arguments to me either. So I'm, not, I'm unimpressed if that's what I have to, if that's the pill I have to swallow. Of course, I mean, if I if I thought that some saying in the Psalms was a good thing, I feel like I've already bitten off the whole conclusion of the argument anyway before we started. So that doesn't seem to be any help to me. You know, as someone who's not a theist, why should I believe that God's good? That's the question. So you can't tell me, well, because it's part of my religion, that's not going to help me because I'm not in that religion. Um, the, only thing, the only other thing I can think of is that it's basically you're just going to say, well, look, this is my definition. Um, that's what I mean by God. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I think that you can go that route, but it just has to be flagged at this point that um, that sort of move is, on, is what's going on here. If you're going to make that type of move, it's just my God concept, right? That this is the God concept I'm um, arguing for here. Um, it's an additional assumption, makes the argument weaker. Um, and you have to let me do that later on if you're allowed to do that, right? We can't be inconsistent about what we're doing. So if that's what we're doing, I just want to be, I just want us to kind of set a marker in, in the sand. So it, it feels to me like there's no good way of getting this Goldilocks zone without conceding something quite a lot to, to me, really, at this point, which is that something, some move like that has to be made. Um, so anyway, it doesn't, I'm not killing the argument by saying that, it just seems to me, we, I think we can, does that feel fair? I mean, do you want to come back before I move into another thing? Well, let me just say the approach. I'd take that last approach. So um, uh, I wouldn't say you, you have to buy the ontological argument. And in particular, you don't have to buy the ontological argument to define God as being a perfect being. Um, <clears throat> you can still think of God as a necessary being without thinking the ontological argument's a good argument. But I'd, I'd say it just goes into the definition. And so that there is a price to pay. You have to ask the question, what is the probability that God is good? And that's going to depend on how you put stuff together. But I just don't see that to be, I mean, wh what do you think that does to the probability, given that the, 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 pro the problems on the naturalist side are, you know, tend to the ludicrously small? I don't think it's going to generate anything that, well, tend to the ludicrously large, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Um, uh, I don't think it's going to generate any sort of probability that affects the argument as a, as a whole. So I'd go that route. Um, you are right that it, there's, there's a price to be paid. I'm just, I don't think that, no, I'll pay it, it's fine. Anyway, good. Okay, good. Back to you. All right, good. So now we've looked at the, the T hypothesis. Right now I want to shift and look at the N hypothesis instead. So let me ways back up to these summaries. So I'm calling this really uh, catchy name, the Stalking Horse Naturalism Hypothesis. Um, hopefully this will make sense. So now we're, now we're focusing in on the N hypothesis instead, right? I mean, let's just be clear that naturalism doesn't have to be defined the way you defined it. Um, and because you helped yourself to a definition of God there, I can do that too, right? So um, 
I'm not part of a church of nat naturalism. Right? I don't have any creed that, associated, that I have to stick to with naturalism. In fact, I'm not really. I'm not even particularly sure I count myself as a naturalist. Right? I think whilst we're on the topic, um, I don't really understand how naturalists explain what numbers are or what logical validity is or what obligations are or what normativity is. Right? I don't understand how any of that works on naturalism. So while I like naturalism in the sense that I like science finding stuff out about things and I feel like I want to, I you know, I'm going to take medicine that's been, you know, science has checked it first and stuff. I'm going to on a plane when people who know what they're doing have designed it. You know, science is good, right? But I don't think it gives you all the answers. So anyway, not particularly committed to naturalism, but let's play the game, right? We're playing the naturalism versus theism game. So I can be a bit more creative with what the naturalism hypothesis is, it seems to me. So, yeah, um, let's, let, so let me just summarize this first, right? I'm going to just chuck in a disposition uh, to naturalism, right? It's, so let's call it something like the hypothesis that um, there's no guiding mind behind the universe or something, right? That's what naturalism means. Um, but it's not just pure chance what happens, right? There's, there's some disposition, right? that just sort of does stuff. Um, yeah, and I don't really want to say too much more about it uh, right now anyway. So it feels to me like I can do that because that's part of how this game works, right? Um, and then I think I can probably just come up with a version of that hypothesis, right? So, so naturalism plus some kind of disposition that would play the game in, in a way that's so similar to the way that the theism hypothesis is playing it that you could never really make a case that what your that your hypothesis was kind of significantly more probable than mine right and that's why it's a stalking horse i'm i think i can just cook up a theory a hypothesis that's that you there's always going to be at the side of the theistic hypothesis in terms of probabilities um so that's what a, that's what a stalking horse hypothesis means so let me go into this in a bit more detail right because that's that's like not very helpful i think it's a summary of what i'm trying to say but um, okay, so the way that Luke talks about N makes me think of something that seems like I think nobody actually thinks about it like that. Right? He thinks of it, I think, as some kind of cos. There's at the beginning of the universe or something. There's some cosmic random number generator, and that spits out values for, like, I don't know, cosmological constant and entropy and the mass of the I don't know, quarks or whatever, right? The, all the stuff that he was talking about before. As if there is, naturalism is the view that all of those values were determined in some kind of cosmic lottery or cosmic raffle that happened before the universe started. And it only spun the numbers once, right? And yeah, I agree on that hypothesis, right? It, it's nuts if the, the chances that exactly this thing would happen are incredibly low, right? But you know, let's just forget about that hypothesis. I don't think anybody believes that that's true, right? That there's some kind of man magic random number generator at the beginning of the universe, and that's why we're here, right? That, I don't think anybody believes that. Um, so I know you're not trying to straw man naturalism. I think that to some extent, naturalists are just not very good at explaining things like this. Um, but I think if you had really sat down and asked them about it, I'd, I'm sure, well, I mean, maybe some of them would, right? There's people out there believe anything, but it doesn't seem like a good, a good naturalism hypothesis. So I'm just going to build a different version of naturalism. Um, it's not going to be very good, right? I don't believe this is true either, right? But I'm just going to say, you know, call it ND, right? Which is the universe has this disposition and it's just a mysterious disposition, right? Just, it just is in some sense, naturalism plus that some disposition just means that it's, L is more likely, right? Just raises the probability that L would happen. That's that's all the disposition does. Um, now, okay. So let's just before I go on to the next slide, sometimes um, I've I've seen with people who advocate fine tuning, they say, look, imagine we're playing cards, right? And I deal um, a royal flash, and then I deal another royal flash, and I deal another blah blah blah, right? and the probabilities that that's happening randomly is like stupidly low. And, you know, Luke can tell you what it is. But it's really, really low, and you'd be foolish for not thinking that I'm cheating, right? I'm probably cheating if that's what happens. I think that's that. I think that's the right inference to make in that case. But part of the reason is because, like, you can see me, right? I'm the agent there. I'm sitting there. It, 
that's why you think I'm cheating. You don't think that my my nan down the street is responsible for it, right? You in, you you attribute some intention, and you, you but you know which agent it is to attribute it to. It's the guy dealing the cards, right? That that's the guy to blame. He's the one cheating. But okay, so I think that's why the inference to cheating rather than chance is the reasonable one there. But let's change the example, right? So I'd say I roll a dice fifty times, and it comes down six every time. I'm not going to believe that that was chance, right? Because it's stupidly unlikely. But I'm not going to think that Luke's cheating, right? Because where's Luke? He's nowhere near, right? It's just me rolling a dice on my own. What I'm going to think is that the dice is loaded, right? It's heavier on one, on the one side, right? And it keeps landing six facing up every time. But that just means that the dice has a disposition to land six, right? There's no intentions needed. I, I can explain why the six is landing, uh, why the dice is landing showing a six every time without having to say, oh, Luke's cheating, right? The bloody Luke trying to make me look like an idiot thinking that this is happening by chance. I don't think that. I just think this is a dice that's heavier on the one side, right? And it seems to me fine tuning could just be like that, right? It looks like chance in some sense, but it's just maybe it's the product of some kind of mysterious disposition we don't understand. Um, and I mean, I feel like it's going to be this thing, this question come up, well, how does that work, right? And all I'm going to say, because it's just a stalking horse hypothesis, is, well, that's just a mystery, right? Um, and I mean, look, at the end of the day, theism is very mysterious, right? How does God make the universe? No, 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 nobody knows that, right? It's it's a mystery. How does God do anything? Right? What all of these properties of God are very mysterious and very confusing. So mystery is built into the theistic hypothesis. And if you can have a mysterious hypothesis, then I can have a mysterious hypothesis, it seems to me. So it, I'm just gonna have one that doesn't have any intentions in it. So let's see, now I can run um, the fine-tuning argument for naturalism with a mysterious disposition, right? So the premise one is exactly the same as in the old argument, right? The probability that the universe will be life um, permitting on naturalism, just standard naturalism is like really, really low. It's not really, really low on new jazzy naturalism with a D. Um, it's it's higher than that, right? And then with the likelihood principle, and then we just conclude that, you know, actually the fact that the universe is life permitting is evidence for uh, the fact that th there's a naturalistic dispositional explanation for it over the idea that there's just naturalism and a random number generator at the beginning of the universe. So that's the fine tuning. It's exactly the same as the fine tuning argument for theism. I mean, it's, I've only changed one, well, two letters right, in the whole argument. It's exactly the same argument apart from that. Um, so I'm, st I'm stalking horsing the argument at this stage, and it seems that it works exactly the same. Well, you might say, look, I, I feel like I, uh, let me just get through this and then we can we can talk about it. But I think you're gonna say, well, look, hold on. Um, theism's more likely than, than this stupid thing you've just come up with. Um, and now we don't wanna be talking about the conditional um, probabilities anymore. We just wanna talk about what, what are our prior probabilities in these hypotheses, right? Which one is more likely on its own? Um, and there's three options really. Like the, the, either um, theism is less likely than um, my, stalking horse hypothesis, um, or it's more likely, or they're the same. Um, but look, I think there is a good case to be made that it has, we, it's gonna be either, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be that either theism is less likely or they're the same. Um, and part of the reason for that is that, um, you know, we have, we have lots of examples of things looking like they were designed. I mean, unless you don't believe in evolution, I think Luke believes in evolution, well, you know, the eye looks like it couldn't possibly have been designed because it's really complicated, right? Well, who wants half an eye? There's no use in that, blah, 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 blah. We know these types of arguments. But you know what? It, what it, it just came about by a naturalistic process. There's a dispositional process it's called something like evolution, right? And, and that, that actually accounts for it. So we've got track records of things like that happening. I think Newton thought that, you know, for the planets to be maintained in their orbits or something, they needed God to, like, set, set them off. But then physics would take over. But, and I think we don't we don't now think that um, God was needed in that either. There's um, mechanistic explanations for for that too. Um, so it's not. It seems to me it's it's not a clear case that that um, theism is going to be more likely, right? This is, the idea that there would be a naturalistic dispositional explanation for fine tuning does seem like it's not completely ad hoc, right? Maybe that's true. Um, and as I said, yeah, maybe it's mysterious, but so is so is the theistic hypothesis. So they kind of draw on that. Right? If you're going to complain that I've just cooked it up and it's mysterious, 
well, it doesn't seem like it's much that that really tells between the two. So I think that uh, you're going to have to. I think that it's going to have to be either three or one here. And if that's true, then it's not just a stalking horse hypothesis. If one is the case, then it's actually more likely. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that probably just is my view. Some theory that you can plug in for MD that I don't know Roger Penrose or Cook Up or someone like that um, will 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 actually explain all of those examples of fine tuning that that Luke was talking about at some point. Right? Yeah. Anyway, I, I, let me stop for a second so I can get what what Luke's response is to that. Uh, your your uh, microphone is muted here. Let me see if I can. I got it. There you go. Very quick. Am I share screening? Yeah. Good. That's a stalking horse. <laughs> I had to look it up. That photo is hilarious. So let's all just enjoy <laughs> that for a minute. Uh, okay. So here's my response to that. Remember that we? I, I said, that, yeah. I've got to. I've got to buy. God is morally good. I've got to buy that. But but there's a there's a probability associated there. You know, if you have whatever your idea of God is, you've got to then ask, what's the probability that God is good? And you've got to try and think through that. Um, and it you know it depends on what your idea of God is. So the naturalist has, if you're going to say that there's some disposition, you've got to start to think, okay, what is the probability <clears throat> of that disposition given naturalism? And if if we're taking just this, you know. The physical universe is all that there is. What's the probability that there would be that disposition? And I think if you push, pull that thread, we head back to, to uh, fine tuning pretty quickly because you've got to ask, okay, <clears throat> the best we could do to try and think through this to say, okay, there's some disposition for some value of the electron mass, right? So far as we know, that's a fundamental thing. Let's take that as an example. Um, what is the probability that that this disposition would prefer this value of the electron mass rather than some other value of the electron mass. And so you look at all the range of the electron masses and you say, okay, what 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 fraction of these dispositions, these possible dispositions, would be dispositions that give us a life emitting universe versus versus I mean there could be a naturalistic disposition for a dead universe, right? Or for some other value of the fundamental constant. And you're back at exactly the same problem, right? Most of these dispositions would end up with a dead universe, which is equivalent to saying that most naturalistic universes are dead and we're just back to the start again. So that that would be my answer to that. Just quickly mm -hmm. on the cosmic random number generator, um Hey, would you mind would you mind uh, taking that taking that that picture off? I want to see your face. <laughs> oh, come on. Surely we want to see this. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to make that my my screen backdrop when I'm done with this. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a good picture. So the, the question is, can you, the picture of the stalking horse, can you make a stalking horse that looks like the real thing, right? So is this naturalistic hypothesis, is it close enough to an actual horse to, to, to work the same way? Uh, and so the... the um, I'd say, no, it just puts us back in the same things. Remembering that you have to, you can't just help yourself to a hypothesis. You have to ask what the probabilities are. In in terms of Bayes' theorem, all you're doing is you're taking a particular piece, which looks very small, and instead of attaching it to the uh, likelihood, you're attaching it to the prior, but it's still there when you try and calculate the posterior, mm -hmm. just to put it in technical terms. Um, so that, that would be my answer there. In terms of cosmic random number generator, remember that, I mean, that's a useful analogy, but it's not literally true. I don't, I distinguished before between chances and Bayesian probabilities. So um, I, it's not that I think on naturalism there's some big spin of the dial. It's just that, um, remember, th remember you, you're telling Bender what the, what the propositions you're interested in. And th if this one doesn't give any information about that one, then the probabilities turn out to be as if they were random, but I, I, I'm not. I don't need a stochastic random number generator, some physical process to actually yeah. justify that. So just to, I, I think we're okay with that. But that, that anyway, that would be my answer. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess look, let's just be clear. So you don't buy the design argument for like biological complexity, presumably. Sorry, Luke. I, I went ahead and uh, I muted you again. I wasn't. 
Yeah, no worries. Um, I'll try not to. Yeah, we should try not to talk over each other, which is fine. So, uh, I th I think when you pull that string, you head back to. Um, well, okay. So I think it goes like this: Does the eye look designed? Well, the eye is explainable in terms of evolution. All right, it's, it's evolution look designed. Well, evolution happens because there are these fine-tuned properties of the universe. Are they yeah. designed? There we I, get it. So I think first... those arguments head us back to fine tuning. Yeah, I get it. But um, I just I'm just trying to clear up that you agree with the first step, right? That um, it looks designed, but it's not actually. It's the product of uh, some kind of millions of years of natural selection uh, and blah blah blah, yeah. right? I mean, As even a... let's let's put the metaphysical foundations mm -hmm. to one side. Just um, you you don't. I mean, because some people do. They think that you know God created kinds or something, and they, they don't change. And Adam and Eve were had eyes because God made them exactly like that. And there's no like pre-human history of evolution or something. I mean, like if you, I just, I, it just, I guess, I just want to know which one of those roughly. I think you think the evolution story is roughly true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the natural process that created the eyes is roughly described by evolution. Yeah. Yeah. So what all I think is that I mean, it just seems to me that, that these two inferences are extremely similar and. Um, you know, if I said, if I said to you, before we had the naturalistic explanation cashed out, and we're having this conversation, and you say, look, the eye, right, must have been designed by some kind of being who wanted there to be, wanted us to see, or something. Um, and I said, well, I mean, maybe, but I think there might be some mechanism that could make that happen without there being any intention. And you said, well, you could scoff at the idea of such a disposition, right? Because there'd be loads of dispositions, and some of them would make you know rubbish eyes, and some of them would make no eyes, and you know that type of disposition. I don't buy that type of answer. But you know, it turns out that was the right answer, and we both agreed that that was the right answer. Putting off that metaphysical question for one moment, we just think that the eye isn't explained primarily in terms of some agent designing it, right? It was, it was, it came about through natural processes. That we agree on that mechanism and i'm just saying you know something like that could happen for the fine tuning and it seems that you just you then say launch into this well you know i scoff at the idea of such a disposition or explanation but you just bought that when we talked about the eye and i just wonder like what's different about those two cases okay so i was there with you for some of that but you then try to say if there's a naturalistic explanation if there's a natural mechanism then it's not designed and I'll, I'll, as a, you know as someone who believes that there is a god who is a creator of the universe i don't believe those are two mutually exclusive categories right um god made the world through naturalistic through not naturalistic through natural processes right uh it, it's not uh, you know i i, I you know it, it wasn't a and then everything was here so I, I don't, they're not two separate categories. And so I'd say it again, you know, when you, I say, you know, we could have done this argument back then. I say the eye looks awfully designed, doesn't it? But I just think it, it, it all of these head to the, 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 the fine tuning argument because for the following reason, let, let's do the track. I think the eye is designed. You say there's a naturalistic process. I say, well, if that's, if it's the kind of, of sorry, naturalistic, natural, I, um, I said there's a natural process that does it. Well, if there's a natural process that does that, it would seem that like that would have to be it's like, you know, if there's a watch, you say, oh, there's a watch factory. Well, a watch factory is designed, right? So if there's a, a process that does it, it would seem to have to be designed uh, or it would you know be a special kind of thing. And so we try to ask what's the physical undergirding of that. And if you do something as basic as not whether evolution happens, but whether atoms are stable something really basic that need that, that needs to happen then we're back at the fine tuning argument and so the reason why that's the interesting place to stop is precisely because that's where naturalism has to end i mean i take so um my my, my understanding of naturalism is shaped an awful lot by sean carroll whose book is behind me um uh, he says you know there's a nat natural explanations come to a certain point and then they stop and then that's all the explanation you get and that's naturalism and so the the interesting if we're trying to try to answer the question is this the kind of universe we'd expect if naturalism were true we're sort of naturally drawn towards that stopping point let's just get as deep as we can in the physics and then look at the sort of ways the universe could have been and apply 
our thinking there precisely because you know if if the if things have stopped then there's no extra explanation to be had on on naturalism kind of by definition um and so we can sort of do a test case of all right let's try and think through what would what would be the case if we we're actually sort of staring at the ultimate laws of the universe so um i i th i think the argument from the eye works because it ultimately leads you to the fine tuning argument. I don't think it works. I, I I think it doesn't work in that it it leads you to expect that the eye was just made um, out of scratch, you know, with a click of the fingers. There was a natural process. I'm fine with that. The natural processes we see around us are not random. Are not random in that sense. Yeah. Okay. So I guess now I worry that um, nothing could ever come as. Uh, not fine-tuned for you and you know because i want to say look the, the similarity between the design argument in biology and the design argument in cosmology um there's a clear like we did find out that there was the in, intent hypothesis was on the table before darwin came along and then we found out that it wasn't actually the right explanation um but you, it seems to me that even even then you say, well, actually, it is still the right explanation, right? So it doesn't really matter whether the eye was designed in the flick of a switch or over millions of years. For you, they both count as design. So it seems to me that, that you just think that there's no real difference between my naturalism hypothesis and the theism hypothesis. Even if there is a disposition, some kind of uh, the universe kind of gets to a, an end and then some algorithm kicks in and it runs it again, the same process, but it like, I don't know, selects for something, I don't know how it works, right? Some like Google algorithm that like it's some special algorithm that does something, who cares, right? But it keeps just iterating out of the universe over and over again, right? And maybe because of the way that that runs, this type of universe just pops out, just ends up happening quite often, right? And so that's the type of thing that would, if it was mimicking evolution, be something like that, the disposition sort of draws the randomness towards a certain point. But, and so it seems to me that that's just different from, that's a mechanistic explanation. It's different from saying that it was designed. And then you, you just want to fold that into the design hypothesis and just say, yeah, but that's, that counts as design as well. And I feel like now, I'm not sure that I can, it's, we're playing roulette, but somehow you, I can't win. <laughs> you are the dealer and you're definitely going to win no matter what, what happens. And so, I, I don't know, I'm not quite sure I can explain this properly. I just get the sense that like, um, we're not playing fair now, no matter what I do you're just going to win somehow. You see what I mean? Yeah, I do. So I, th I think if the way I think Richard Dawkins would think about this was you evolution is kind of you get that for free, right? So y you start with any old thing and eventually if something starts replicating, then you'll get lots of those. And then if something starts replicating itself, then you've got self-replication and then you'll get increases in complexity. You'll start to get competition for resources and hey presto darwin off you go and you'll you'll get it for free so that i think was the idea it, the reason why dawkins would say the the next step of the argument doesn't work the way that he, you know it would win is okay the eye looks fine-tuned the eye is the product of evolution is evolution fine-tuned well according to dawkins no it's the sort of thing that just sort of happens my, my argument is okay if we went to physics and we said, okay, what is it? <clears throat> what does the universe need to make evolution happen? And and that sort of thing happened in any old universe. Then then that would be interesting. You know, if if any old universe just made, just had the the necessary conditions for matter that did interesting stuff, then then I you know that that would be the way that that argument ends nicely for the naturalist. So there, there's not, in that sense, there's a there's a question here to be asked that's not sort of heads I win, tails you lose. It's it's Pick pick a um, random universe in some sense, and some well, however you can get a, a handle on the the set of naturalistic universes there could have been. Try and get a handle on that, and see whether it will do the stuff that that will lead via evolution to give you an eye. Um, and I think the answer to that is in fact no. But it's not no by definition. It's just in fact no. We you, you have to sit down and actually do the calculations of changing the the masses of these particles to see what actually happens. And it turns out the periodic table falls apart. Yeah. So that, that would be my answer. There. I, I, I don't. 
there could have it could have it could have been the case that life is is kind of like a black hole and you make black holes easily right? they're a piece of cake right and if you could make life out of a black hole or if it turned out we were made out of a black hole then the fine tuning argument wouldn't work you just black hole piece of cake but that, that's not the case with the situation we're in so and this is a genuine question i had nothing that's planned but it, uh, is it conceivable for you that there could be a development in science a uh, you know, big paradigm shift thing, new Einstein comes along, everyone starts thinking about stuff completely differently. And uh, and that makes you go, ah, oh, right, ha, huh, fine tuning of the physical constants and initial conditions. Ah, that's not a thing, I, I, I was wrong. Is, there, is it conceivable that that, is that on the horizon even potentially? There, no, there have been cases where, that, where what we thought was fine tuning has been overturned. You know, I literally wrote a paper on that myself. So there were cases in the in the seventies, uh, Friedman Dyson, and then into Barrow and Tipler's book in the nineteen eighties, saying, "Okay, here's, here's the case: two two protons right? in our universe they don't stick together. Put them together, they fall apart. So in, when the sun tries to burn protons to sort of light itself, it has to wait for one of them to sort of via the weak force turn into a neutron, and then it all works." The argument from fine tuning was supposed to be if we make the strong force a bit stronger, two protons will stick and then stars will burn out too quickly. Right? It's just too easy to stick two of them together. Um, so if 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 the if two protons could stick together in the sun right now, if you just did it right now, uh, the sun would burn through its entire fuel in about one second. And everyone went, well, that's a fine tuning case. All our stars are explosive. But actually, you, if you do it from scratch, um, what you find out is if you look through stellar models, you actually have to do the calculation. All that, all that would actually happen is stars would just be a bit more, uh, a bit cooler and a bit less dense. But actually, you can make stars that work pretty much the same way. And so that's a case where we thought there was fine tuning. Turned out there wasn't you, you know, a, a universe in which protons stick to each other can have stars and so i yeah I, um so yeah that's you know journal of cosmology and astroparticle physics barnes 2015. um so there are cases like that absolutely the problem is there's a lot of the the problem with that case was it was all done in, intuitively not through the models you have to you have to go and do the physics mm. there are enough cases where we've done the modeling and it's not been overturned so the question then is, could new physics overturn it? And the answer is yes, um, sure. Um, it would be, uh, I think it would be kind of weird, but one of the ways could be if there's a, is it, if there's a multiverse. But then we try to do the same argument, right? There must be some physics of the multiverse. If, if naturalism, if all your explanations end at whatever the physics of the multiverse is, then you go and look at what the physics of the multiverse could have been and you try and do the whole thing again. The reason why we focus on physics as we know it is because this is physics as we know it. Oh, so, because it feels to me like, well, it, so I, I, I didn't really want to bring up the multiverse because, um, I don't know, it's, it's a cliche thing to, to bring up in this kind of conversation, but I felt like uh, we, were, we were going along that, what you were saying then was, look, fine tuning is an empirical, it's contingent, like I, we find it out not through a priori reasoning, I, I don't know that the universe is fine tuned just by thinking about it. I know the universe is fine-tuned by doing experiments, modeling, churning through the numbers and the data and finding that out empirically. Um, but I feel like I want to, I mean, so I don't know, may, maybe it's a multiverse hypothesis or some other hypothesis, like my stalking horse hypothesis. I mean, is it a priori that it would have to end in the, so I, I, I cooked up the disposition, right? But maybe that's just a poor example. Is it a priori that there couldn't be an example that didn't run into that? Well, you know, so I'm saying the, the, fine, the, the constants look fine-tuned, but maybe there's some explanation for it. And your move is to say, yeah, but the explanation for it would end up being fine-tuned itself, right? And I'm just asking, is that an a priori deduction? Or would, don't you have to do the experiments on that to know that? Like, um, it seems to me if you say that fine-tuning is discovered empirically, then you couldn't know whether my stalking horse hypothesis uh, needed to be fine tuned, led to a fine tuning problem a priori. You'd have to run the experiments to know that. So, like, why are you saying that in advance? And that, 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 it's puzzling to me, isn't it? Empirical. Uh, 
So it, it's not quite that it's empirical. I mean, we're talking about ways the universe could have been. Um, it's it's you you have to act, <clears throat> given any set of physics, right? So here's here's the way I think about it. We're trying to trying to work out what could the universe have been like on naturalism. And I think the way to do that is to say the best handle we can get on that is to say, let's just take the best laws we've got and try and change the way that they are in some systematic way. And you look at them and you say, oh, these constants, that's a really systematic way I could change the laws and look at other ways the universe could have been. And so um, if a new set of laws comes along, we'll do the same thing with those. And one of the ways in which it could turn out that the, they aren't fine-tuned is if the new set of laws gives us a multiverse. But uh, that's not, I mean, we, we're just going to have to deal with that hurdle if it comes along. And it's interesting to me that the ways in which we're supposed to have a, a multiverse that have been proposed so far, sort of, they turn out to be fine-tuned. They turn out to be fine-tuned, right? They, I mean, it could have been the case you just get it for free, but something like cosmic inflation, um, you know, you don't, you know, it, it, the, the universe in its earlier stages has a very rapid expansion. This is supposed to sort of create different bits of the universe that have different properties. Um, if you, for the models that we have, if you start varying the numbers, you don't necessarily get inflation. Like you just, you just don't end up making a universe. So the analogy I like for this, which which kind of works, is suppose you know someone points out that if the Earth was five percent closer to the sun or whatever it is, then um, all the oceans would boil off, something like that. I don't actually know. And so the conversation then for me goes like this: All right, uh, that looks interesting. And then someone says, Well, there's lots of other planets out there with different distances to their stars, like the multiverse for planets. The thing we want to say that, okay, can you make lots of planets for free or does that process make need fine tuning? And what we know about cosmology at the moment says that needs fine tuning. It's e awfully easy to make a universe in which there's no structure whatsoever. So it says, all right, multiverse, we'll just um, have a some theory in which you just make lots of universes. And now I just want to do the same process again. Give me a theory and I'll look at the possibilities. But if we don't have that, then I can't. Yeah. So Alex, uh, I wanted to see what you want to do uh, at this point, because we could either we could either like keep this discussion going, or we could look at one of your other objections that you had prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, just leaving it up to you. Wh which uh, what do you prefer? Uh, let's do both. <laughs> let's just very quickly. Um, okay. Yeah, because we are running out of time. We got about half an hour yeah. left, so I, I would think we probably have enough time for maybe one one more. Cool. Okay, so let me just see if I summarize and, if, and see if Luke's cool with this being is fair. So the idea is I'm, I can cook up a naturalistic hypothesis that's got some kind of disposition, maybe some multiverse, blah, 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 who cares? Um, and then the response to that is to say, well, look, it's not really a stalking horse, right? It's not quite as good as the real thing because it's going to require fine-tuning at some point down the line. And then I said, is that an a priori claim? Do you know that for sure by reasoning alone? And you said, well, it's kind of empirical, but like given all of the plausible, given all of the multiverse models we're looking at so far, it just turns out that they do need um, fine tuning. It just seems to me that the status of that rebuttal is contingent rather than necessary. Like you haven't you haven't refuted my claim; you've rebutted it. Like if because if if a new if a Darwin for cosmic evolution came along, you would you would eat your hat there, and you would admit the data was. Uh, done its job, right? So this stalking horse hypothesis is possible, right? You can't actually show that it's not possible. Um, you just, you, you, as an informed cosmologist, you're just saying there's nothing on the table right now that looks like it does that job because all of them look like they need fine tuning as well. And I'm not an informed cosmologist. So I'm happy to say, okay, then, you know, <laughs> that's fine. You're just saying that the status of that is as a rebuttal rather than a reputation. Anyway, and I think that's, is that fair? Just so we can move on? Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I mean, I'm happy to say, look, that. The, the, the best we can do to try and get a handle on this, you know, what could have been the case on naturalism is the best physics we have. And, I mean, if it's all pointing in the same direction, I'm happy for it to be a contingent claim. I just find it, it can still be a convincing claim. Yeah, could sure. Be. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. So let's move. So, okay, let me see. 
All right, now I think I'm going to go on the attack a bit more. Um, I, I, I don't think I need slides for this, right? Like the, I guess the part of the problem for me is that I find the theistic hypothesis incredibly implausible for various reasons, right? It's, I mean, it, it just doesn't seem on the same level as uh, a made-up mystery naturalism hypothesis. Even that rubbish and, and lacking in detail, though it is, still seems to be better than the theistic hypothesis, right? Um, so let me try and explain why I think that, right? Like, first of all, the theistic hypothesis at minimum, and the Swinburne quote you put basically said this, that um, there's a mind, right? There's an intellect which is behind the way things are, right? But the, being outside of the way things are, outside of space and time, it's a mind which doesn't isn't in time, right? But to me, that kind of I mean, look, here's here's a way of thinking why that doesn't make any sense to me. I can imagine that the the world doesn't exist at all, right? That I'm all that exists. My mind is just just some eye of consciousness opens, has a dream, and then shuts again. Who who knows? Some that's kind of on the cards. For for all I know, I can conceive of that being the case. I don't think it's the case, right? I think there's probably good reasons to think that's not what's going on, but it, it's conceivable, right? And it seems to me that the, the theistic hypothesis is further away in conceivability than that very radical position. Because what a mind is, it seems to me, from the inside, I know very well what a mind is. It's a sequence of phenomenological experiences, right? Uh, thoughts, perceptions, feelings, right? They come in a linear sequence, right? And when I go to sleep and I don't dream about anything, there is no mind present there, right? It's gone. The mind just stops. It wakes up again, starts running again. When, you know, when I open my eyes and stuff starts happening, right? When the sequence begins again. So it seems to me that it's an essential property of being a mind that you are a, a linear sequence of things, of experiences, right? So when you're saying to me, this this is how I hear it. Right? Look, there are these really unlikely things that could have happened by chance, right? The gravitational blah blah blahs. Um, so that means that there is an, an insert, in literally inconceivable hypothesis. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? I I literally cannot conceive of it. I just I just don't know how to. Right. And so here's another one. I just give you another one extra one, although I think there's a couple of these. Um, what you're telling me again, right? This thing is located outside of time. But look, I timeless beings. Right? I've done enough metaphysics. Like the, you know, a platonic object, right? The timeless entity, the number eight or something, right? They're causally inert. Right? Like the number eight doesn't cause anything to happen, right? It's more than just causally inert. It's inert. Full stop. Doesn't do anything, right? It's not just that it doesn't happen to do anything. Right? It's been asleep and not bothering, lazy or whatever. Lazy number eight. It can't do anything, right? That's that's part of what it is. Um, a non-temporal object is inert, right? That's part of the meaning of a non-temporal object. And the reason that it's part of the meaning is because doing is temporal, right? Doing is something that takes place at a time. And, and let's make it slightly more focused. Causation is, is a temporal relation, right? Effects normally happen before the, no, sorry, causes normally happen before their effects. Let's just throw in simultaneous causation for the sake of it. That's still a temporal relation, right? At the same time as, right? But a, a timeless being can't be in a temporal relation of any type to anything, even a simultaneous one. So how can a, non a timeless agent A, do anything and B, cause anything? So it seems to me that that's like saying, because it's an inert being, and that being inert means you can't do anything, it's like saying a married bachelor. Right? It's it's a it's incon inconsistent. Right? So I it's so it's inconceivable and it's incoherent. Right. So you're saying, oh look, there's these weird co coincidences. Right. It's like dealing out loads of uh, royal flushes. I couldn't have happened by chance. So it's this literally inconceivable, literally incoherent hypothesis. Uh, by that, there's the explanation. And so, yeah, any explanation is going to be better than one that I can't imagine and seems inconsistent. So what do you say to that? Okay, uh, so 
within the context of the argument, uh, obviously, if the prior probability of God is zero, then that's game over. Um, so that's yeah, fine. Um, just quickly, the the problem with N D the this with the disposition, it's not so much that it's mysterious for me. It's that when I try to understand what its probability is, I get the same small number that comes out of fine tuning. So uh, that raises the question of how strong you think this argument is that that the idea of God is is inconceivable and inconsistent. Um, if you've got a proof there, um, inconceivable, inconsistent. Yeah, I mean, write those down. Uh, if you've got a proof there, then you're done, right? Probability zero, we all move on with our lives. If you're not totally sure, though, then you've got to start to sort of weigh up these different probabilities. So the, <clears throat> the strike against naturalism is this sort of fine-tuning strike, which I think is pretty significant. You've then got to say, okay, um, how how strongly committed am I, you know, how, how strong do I think these arguments are that, that God is inconceivable and inconsistent? So let me say a few things about those. With, in terms of the mind outside of time, um, there's a few moves to make here. Let me make a, a, a sort of Thomistic one. Well, I'm not, I haven't fully bought into Thomas Aquinas because I don't fully understand what he's going on about, but this at least made sense to me. So let me try one attack here. So Aquinas distinguishes between three uses of language. You probably just probably know this, but never mind. Uh, equivocal, unequivocal, and analogical. So if I say, um, Equivocal would be um, I, I love my wife and the score in the tennis is one love. It, the word love in those two sentences just happens to be the same noise. Right? So those are totally equivocal. Unequivocal would be used exactly the same way. Oh, I love my son and I love my daughter. In those two sentences, love is being used exactly the same way. But there's another way we say in the middle of those two ways, as it were. If I say I love my wife and I love ice cream, I'm not saying exactly the same thing with love in both of those cases, but I'm not saying totally different things either. If you understand one, you have some way of understanding the other. I think when we call God a mind, if, especially if you're a Thomist and you're thinking ground of being, all of that sort of stuff, uh, God is the principle of all reality, whatever that means. The saying that God is a mind, so it's a it's a statement of 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 uh, Aquinas's view that anything we say positively about God is analogical. It's in this middle ground. The only things you can say unequivocally are negative statements. God is un, you know, unlimited or something. Um, and so I, there will be some analogy between our minds and what God is. And if you understand what a mind is from our perspective, you will have some understanding about what God is, but it won't necessarily be the total one-to-one -one unequivocal usage. Uh, now that it might sound like a very long way to just sort of bail out on some of the things you think are essential to minds might not be properties of God. So, for example, uh, having one thought after another in time. Well, God is, you know, it, if you're trying to think of a a being which created time, then you, at some point you've got to say, all right, our usual understanding of minds and brains and all that isn't quite going to cut it. So similarly, um, uh, the, the category you've sort of got to create for God is that God is, in, in this understanding, God is a concrete necessary being. So it's necessary in the same sense that 2 plus 2 is 4 is necessary, but still got a concrete being. So God is, is not causally inert, but causally active. Now you say causation is temporal. There are various ways people have tried to understand that. It, it might just be one of the things that's not essential to causation. Or you could say with William Lane Craig that as soon as God causes something in time, God then becomes temporal, not by changing himself, but by there being some relation to time. I mean, I'm an astronomer, bloat if I know. Um, so I, I think the thing to do with these, I mean, the thing to do is, is to, you know, think harder, right? I mean, just keep thinking about them. And if you do come to the conclusion that, yeah, the, 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 this God idea is, is inconsistent and um, inconceivable, then you've got a defeater for any any argument for the existence of God. Fine. Um, all I'd, I'd want to say is it, it, it's got to be a proof, right? If you're just saying, you know, probably we don't, you know, or I can't understand how... It could be the case that 
then you haven't quite got a proof, and then you've got to start weighing up A versus B. Yeah, okay, good. So um, it's not quite the same as saying, I mean, let's distinguish between an argument, a really terrible argument, which would just be, uh, I don't know how to speak French, so therefore nobody speaks French. Right? It's a terrible argument. You can't just go from stuff you don't know to saying that that means stuff like that doesn't happen. And that's not the argument I'm making. At least it doesn't seem to me that's the argument I'm making. Um, because, and the difference is that like, um, it's got, I think it's got something to do with your relation to the thing that like, okay, so it, it's something like where sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence and sometimes it isn't, right? That, that argument can be good and it, and it depends on, on your relationship to the thing. Like, should you expect to see the thing now? If you should expect to see the thing there, then it not being there is good evidence that it's not there, right? Mm -hmm. on, and vice versa the other way around. So look, I should expect to be able to distinguish what we're talking about here. When I'm, when I'm, I'm saying something very modest, it seems to me, about the, the nature of what my mind is like. I'm not saying how it comes about. I'm not saying what it's made of or uh, what the rules are in any deep way. I'm simply saying that and I think you agree, I mean, please tell me if you have a different internal phenomenology, which would be great, because, you know, we could think about that. But um, for me, my entire life long, all the things, all the different things that have come and gone in my life, all the things that have happened, that's what my mind is. I, I, I have a good understanding of what it's like. Right? It's not like, I'm, I'm probably more sure about what this aspect of what my mind is like than most of the other things that you've said. Like I, I said at the beginning, you could just be a figment of my imagination. All of the physics that you coughed up could be just my subconscious trying to confuse my consciousness in some kind of weird dream that I'm having. And that's more plausible than that I have misunderstood this very basic idea of what the mind is like, it seems to me. I'm, I'm not pretty sure about this. And it's, it's not quite as sure as I am that I'm existing at all. I feel more, more, even more sure about that. Right? But this idea about what the mind is like is very, very fundamental. And that, that leads into the analogy um, escape route as well. I mean, yeah, you can say, look, you can say, um, look, God, God's uh, computational capacity is like ours, but it's also not like ours, right? I sometimes sit down and I try and work out the probability of uh, rolling six sixes or something, and I get there in the end, and it's really painful and slow, and I often make mistakes, right? God, when he does that, it's not quite the same as what I'm going through, you might say, but um, it, it is in some senses, right? He's, he's still kind of like doing computation, whatever that means, uh, but he, he just always gets it right and he does it at lightning speed or something like that. Right? He's like super duper great. And so that's, that's the analogy. I can tell you the aspect that's similar and the aspect that's different. Like that's how an analogy works. And it seems to me that what you're talking about here is you're saying, look, it's, like, it's a bit like a mind, right? But, and so in some sense, like a mind's got desires for one thing, he desires for there to be a life in the universe. Um, he has intentions and blah, blah, blah. He loves you, whatever. But on the other hand, um, the, the thing that's so different, right? When we, when, so if we just focus in on like, well, what's, it, what, what's God's mind like phenomenologically? Because mine is like this sequence of events that happens. Like, what's the analogy here? I know what mine's like, but he doesn't share that aspect. Is there anything you can tell me that it shares? Because if not, we're not doing an analogy. We're just doing, it's like a mind, but in no way like the experience that you have, like the specific thing that we're talking about. It's just different. It's not an analogy. It's just a black hole of not. And that means, like, if, if that's where it goes, and it seems to me that that is where it goes, then it's not a watertight a priori deduction that God doesn't exist. But it's pretty devastating for this as an explanatory hypothesis, right? Because when it push comes to the shove, uh, even the Aquinas analogy escape route seems to be just a big bucket that you're dropping the concept in that I'm not allowed to look into. And like as an, I just feel like I'm not really being given any explanation here. Like I want to know, like just basic stuff about what this hypothesis is supposed to be. And it feels to me when I lift up the lid and try and look in, it's just it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like saying, look, there's just this married bachelor at the start of the universe, right? And that's how it happens. I just don't know what you mean, right? But so this is my fun I have such fundamental problems with the this is why to me it doesn't really seem like it's even 
it doesn't get anywhere close to um, being uh, an argument that persuades me that God exists or something. It is, I mean, my problems are much deeper than with the fine tuning argument, I suppose. Maybe they're too fundamental for for this conversation, even. Hmm. Uh, so I uh, <laughs> oh, let me just say very quickly. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you need to start reading, <laughs> reading a good theologian uh, to see whether you, whether they can try to explain it better than I can. Any any sort of proof is going to need to say. You said it before. You know, it is a central property of the mind that dot dot. dot. Um, and then, and then my sort of get out would be okay. That's an that's a property of your mind, but that's not an essential property of minds that I'm relying on. And then the, the the response to that is, okay, is there anything left of this idea that God is a mind that I can grab a hold on? Right. Um, so the the things that in in terms of the fine tuning argument, I think the the sort of the analogy that we need is simply that there are. A, you know, the way my mind works is if I'm trying to design something, there's a whole heap of ways that I could put this set of Lego together and uh, all of those possibilities, because I want to make the thing on the box, I put together one one particular possibility out of all the possibilities and for a particular end because, because it achieves something. And... Uh, one of the things you can sort of try to do is to take your own mind and just try and ratchet things up a bit. You said, um, if I want to calculate something, I, you know, I sit down, I try to work it out, and then I, it sort of gradually dawns on me. And then, right, so, okay, take that. And if, if you were thinking clearly, it would happen more quickly. And so if you think of like a perfect mind, it would just be like being in that state of realisation the whole time. And is that helpful? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so you know, I, I can't claim to I, I totally understand all the everything I read from theologians about God. Again, I, I just want to say, look, I mean, it, it, the, one of the ways the fine tuning argument could work is, is okay if you're prepared to say, let's give this God hypothesis a start. Let's just see, say, you know, maybe it might explain something. There's a, there's a lot of explanatory work it can do just because naturalism. The raw naturalism, um, without that hypothetical D, although with that D, as as I was trying to argue, is 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 so bad that maybe I should could think of something weirder. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, don't know, Cameron. Did you want to do some uh, questions? I mean, I can keep going. I have another objection I can bring up, but if you want to take some questions from other people or something. Sorry, I've I've just been uh, listening to the back and forth, and I uh, I just commented on the, the YouTube page that this is one of my favorite discussions on fine tuning I've listened to, so I've just been I've just been sitting back and, and enjoying it. Um, but oh, so let me let me throw this out there. So um, I don't know if this is specific to Swinburne. I don't think it is, uh, but he defines God at least the personal side of it in the sense of like he has intentions, he has beliefs. And he has powers, so that doesn't seem too different from when I when I reflect on my like my own understanding of what a mind is. That doesn't seem too far off to have thoughts and beliefs and intentions and powers. That seems pretty um, pretty similar to, to my experience of, of who who I am. And even back to your example of like, you know, it could just be that everything out here that I'm experiencing is an illusion. Um, that doesn't have any bearing on this understanding of personhood, right? Because that could be the case, but I would still have intentions and beliefs and powers. So, what what are your what are your thoughts on that, Alex? Um, I mean, I suppose my my it's you can say, oh, look, God has thoughts and beliefs and powers, and um, that's that's great. It's just that um, my my issue is. Uh, to, is that anything more than just saying it, right? Like I can say that, look, oh, there's someone at my door. It's a married bachelor come around to see me, right? But I can say it, right? But that doesn't mean that it makes any sense. So we have to, I mean, the, the difficulty, it seems to me that there's a high, well, I don't want to talk about probabilities, but I worry, right, that there are certain theological strings of words that that are meaningless, right? That you can just say stuff. I mean, you're probably going to, have that opinion about certain mantras in other religions that they're not really 
picking stuff out that exists, right? They're stringing concepts together that don't really mean anything. Um, and it's just, it, I worry that that's what's going on here when we look at this natural theology stuff, that it doesn't, it's just like, doesn't make sense. And people just try and say, oh, it's a mystery and you need to be like thinking harder and blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, it, you can think really hard about what a married bachelor is and never get there because, and it might just be that I'm lacking in a se severe enough devotion to the idea to, to really get it. Well, you know, I'm just not cognitively able. It might just be that it's nonsense, right? And there's this kind of worry, it's existential worry, that you're never really going to know one way or the other which one it is. So I'm sitting here in the shop of hypotheses looking at which one to buy, and I just don't know that it's not nonsense, right? And that's a massive um, turn off for me. I don't want to buy a hypothesis that maybe explains stuff, like I said, in a kind of ad hoc way, but it, I'm worried that it's not really doing anything other than that. It's not just that a deeper understanding will, will make that go away. It might just, might just be nonsense. So so it's, I suppose that's my issue. So what's your take on, uh, so earlier Luke was like, let me see if I can explain it as clearly as him. Um, so he was talking about when we're thinking of the prior probability of theism, um, unless you've got a proof that it's zero, then you're just dealing in probabilities. And even if you're like, well, I don't know, I, I can't really make sense of this God concept, that doesn't constitute a proof. That doesn't show that the probability of theism is zero. That would just mean that, hey, we may not know what that probability is. Um, Luke, what do you, what do you, so, um, well, actually that, that might, uh, I was going to take it into skeptical theism, but that might actually eat up all the time that we have left. We only have about five to 10 minutes. That's a really inter uh, interesting discussion too, is how skeptical theism plays into all of this. And unfortunately we're sort of out of time before we can get into that. Um, er earlier, Alex, you were talking about HUD Hudson. He has a, a talk mm -hmm. online on YouTube where that's the objection that he has to the fine tuning argument is that right. it's, uh, the, the skeptical theism bit that we can't actually put any kind of probability on the first, uh, or sorry, the second premise that the probability is not very, very low, given the sort of concerns that arise out of skeptical theism that we don't really know the mind of God, we're cognitively limited. So we can't really make any assessment of that premise at all. Like we should just withhold judgment sort of thing. Um, and in that case, we can't run the argument at all. Um, well, Luke, why don't, why don't we get your thoughts on that and then from there, we'll move into uh, closing thoughts, and then we'll we'll uh, close out today. Uh, very quickly, uh, I think there's there's two moves you can't make if you're faced. So uh, uh, the way the the argument's presented, you do have <laughs> uh, is that your stalking horse. Um, uh, the way the argument is is presented, we have you have to ask the question: What's the probability that a good God would, God would want to create a universe like this? And if you're looking at the problem of evil, you might want to say, all right, we have no idea whether God would allow all of this evil. And then what you can't say then is, well, uh, actually all this, uh, you know, all the good stuff, that's totally what God's after and then run it that way. So those two seem to be clashing. Um, so that that is a problem. Uh, it's the one Neil Manson raises in this this paper. So my argument would be, I, I don't take the step, the skeptical theist case against uh, the problem of evil. In particular, it depends what you're skeptical of. I mean, it, whether a certain set of, whether something you see in the universe is good is going to depend on whether you think you know what good is and what you think is really going on out there. So you could disagree, you know, with the details of, you know, uh, you, you could think you know what God thinks is good and evil without thinking that you know the, the specific reason for the stuff around. And then you kind of, you're in a middle way between these two. So all I'd say for that one is, is yeah, you, there is some theology to be done on my side. I I just don't find it. Uh, that if you're trying to weigh the two up, remember that it's it's the naturalism side is so bad. That's the fine tuning argument that actually worries about would God want to create a universe that has conscious agents, moral agents in it? I just don't find that anywhere near as improbable. So that that would be my short answer to that. So uh, we're right at the. We're, we've got about ten minutes left. Why don't we do this? So Alex, why don't you? Uh, Respond to that if you want to, and then give like, you know, three to five minute uh, reflections on the uh, discussion today. And then from there, we'll pass it over to Luke to give your reflections, and then we'll close it out. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, I don't know what my reflections are. Um, let me see. 
so um, another argument I wanted to bring up was which I really liked um, is that uh, so there's this really cool paper called um, fine tuning versus electrons in love by Neil Sinababu I think that's his name I think it's how you pronounce it um, do you know that paper Luke what you do yeah yeah sort of Okay, so the idea is that um, God is a disembodied mind, right? So on the theism hypothesis, it's possible that there are disembodied minds, right? So then you can't advocate the theism hypothesis and then get all picky about what psychophysical laws are, are metaphysically possible. You, you basically have to allow any possible psychophysical laws. So then he's like, well, so, you know, God could have just made electrons conscious, right? And it could just be that the uh, psychophysical laws are such that, like, when they get a an, an prime number of, uh, dis of meters apart from each other, they fall in love with each other. And when they um, bump into each other, they uh, feel embarrassed about touching each other, stuff like this, right? And then, you know, it, it's crazy, right? It's kind of fanciful. But the point is that, like, you've really got nothing to stop it. Like, how can you say they couldn't be? Uh, and then all you need is, like, um, universes that can allow basic microphysical particles. And there's loads of those, right? And then, and they're not fine. So that's, you know, once the psychophysical laws go out the window, fine tuning seems to go out the window as well. And I really like that uh, argument because, like, A, I really like the paper. It's hilarious. Um, and B, it seems like a really clever, uh, like I was saying before, getting at the soft underbelly of the fine tuning argument. Like, I mean, don't go for the physics, right? Leave the physics to the physics guys. Um, think about how the physics argument intersects with theology and the interesting ph philosophical issues, right? That there, it seems to me, there's everything to play for, right? I'm not a physicist. You're a professional cosmologist. Your life's work is doing fine tuning. But I knew I could have a good conversation with you because it's not all. I'm not going to be debating the mass of the photon or whatever with you. Right? I mean, that's not actually important to the argument. Really. I mean, I just concede that the um, probabilities are astronomically unlikely, and then we just keep going with the argument from that. So everything interesting happens after the physics stuff stops, from my point of view. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. I th summing up, I guess, I feel like uh, my objections to the fine-tuning argument, such that they are, um, run too deeply for, for it to be overcome by uh, pretty much anything. I just don't see I could ever really... Um, I'd need a massive change of worldview before I could start seeing that as evidence for God existing. So yeah, I don't know. That'll do as my sum up. Thanks. All right. Um, just... Very quickly, I've been in an email conversation with a guy called Philip Goff, who's a philosopher in Budapest, actually. He wrote an interesting article for E.ON, um, which is just entitled, Is the Universe a Cosmic Mind? And so that's another, yeah, this sounds like your, our electrons in love. So his idea is, all right, you know, theism, his, his main objection is you just run into the problem of evil and then you're, you're finished. What if we just sort of made the universe itself a mind and it would be an imperfect mind because it's made out of matter, but it's fundamentally, you know, that sort of stuff at the bottom. So uh, I think, look, there, there are other options to explore here. I mean, no one argument proves everything. Um, and certainly if, if you've got, if, if you think you can prove that, that the idea of God is inconceivable and inconsistent, then you've got a defeater for any, any philosophical argument, any, well, certainly any contingent one. Um, you, yeah. Uh, so, it, but uh, again, just you. I th I think if you really think hard about the, the problem here for me, really is is naturalism, and I think there's a problem here with naturalism that fine tuning sort of exposes. If you're going to say, as as some naturalist has, not necessarily Alex, uh, if you're going to say the ultimate laws of nature are just the, the stopping point for every any explanation about reality, then if you want to think through that systematically, you've got to start thinking through how could the universe have been on naturalism. And I think once you do that, it, it's like exploring the set of possibilities for, you know, the the roulette wheel or whatever, any other thing. It, there's just such an enormous uh, set of possibilities there of which an only very small number actually explain the universe we see around us that you would start you should start going to look at other ideas including some that sound pretty weird like even you know cosmic what do you call it cosmic psychism cosmopsychism 
<laughs> uh, I don't buy it, but I mean, you, you, I, I think, you know, this, maybe the, there's a reason, maybe reasons, my, minds might be a bit too, <laughs> maybe reasons are there at the bottom floor of the universe and they'll tell us why the universe is the way it is. But uh, I think if, if, if fine tuning at least gets you thinking along those lines, I think what fine tuning shows is the bar is extremely low for any competitor to naturalism. It does such a terrible job of explaining why this universe is this way rather than some other way that actually, you know, certainly an idea as old as theism should get a, should get uh, should get your attention to try to think whether it actually makes sense. You might get to the end of the day and think it doesn't, but you should at least, you know, put the effort in to 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 try and, you know, read some, you know, read some Swinburne or read whoever to try and work out whether this thing makes sense. So I'll leave it there. Alex, I have one last question for you. Um, mm -hmm. So of of the arguments that you know of for God's existence, which one would you say is the strongest? Is the, is the fine-tuning argument the one that you think has the most going for it, or is it some other argument? Um, what do you mean which one do I find the most persuasive? Which one Which one has the most... I'm putting it in this, in this way so that you're not committing to, to much of anything. Which, which one has the most going for it of all the arguments? Yeah, well, I'm not sure what you mean by going for it. I mean, it's valid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're all okay. valid. Right? Um, they're all, and the question is whether the premises are sound, more or less, all the time. Uh, with professional philosophical arguments, it's going to be valid. Um, so they all have that going for them. Um, I don't think any of them are free from some type of issue that buried inside the formal valid argument, there'll be some inference that doesn't work, or there's some premise in there that um, is either false or just doesn't really have any justification for it. I, I'm, I don't really distinguish between them that, that well. And I'm really interested in philosophy of religion. I really like philosophy of religion. And I, I, I just I have a more or less uniform opinion about the uh, arguments for God. I just none of them are persuasive at all. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I'm uh, I'm really happy uh, that I was able to that we were all really able to find a time that worked because Alex, you live in the UK, Luke, you live in Australia, I live in Houston, Texas. So it's like we had to find one time that basically worked for all of us. So I'm. Really happy that we could make it work. And I think, Luke, what, you have to run off and go play piano. That's, I know. do. So, uh, well, anyways, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, guys, for coming on. I uh, hope to do it again in the future. Alex, we talked about doing a discussion on Molinism because that's your 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 biggest area of expertise. Uh, expertise. I would love to, to set that up. So, um, anyways, thanks again, guys, for coming on. And uh, if you're watching the, uh, the channel right now and uh, you've enjoyed the discussion, head over to... Uh, well, actually, just hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel, first of all, but then head over to the website, check out everything else we have going on. And again, if you want to support the ministry, patreon.com slash capturing Christianity is the way to do it. And without, uh, without further ado, we'll see you guys next time.